Welcome to Studio Potter. This month, Austin Taylor wrote a review of the Ceramics Congress that happened in uh, the, at the end of November after the Thanksgiving holiday. And we thought we would touch base with the creator of the Ceramics Congress and the Ceramics School, Josh Collinson, to find out a little bit more about this new platform uh, for ceramic artists. Hi, Josh, thanks for joining me today. Hey, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Josh, would you start by um, introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about your background and training and how the ceramic school came to exist? Sure. I'm from Lancaster in England. My, my mum is a potter, so she's been doing pottery for, I don't know, 20 years, I guess. And I've always had, you know, kilns in my basement and um, pottery wheels there and uh, accompanied her to the shows and things to try and sell her pots. Yeah, it's always just been a big part of growing up, I guess, art and ceramics. And my dad is, he's a programmer, a computer programmer. So I've kind of got the best of both worlds. Yeah, where to start really? I don't know. I, I originally wanted to study art, fine art and be an artist. So that's what I did at high school. That's what I did at uh, university. My first job was actually an art technician in my high school. That's I got paid like £3.50 an hour or something ridiculous uh, just to like wedge clay and, and help set up and load the kilns and things. But then during art university, during my foundation year, really, I just got annoyed at the teachers saying as well, like, what's the point in going to art, you know, what's the point in studying art at university? You're not going to be able to do anything afterwards apart from be a teacher, right? And there I kind of swapped into doing 3D animation instead. It was a big thing at the time. It was like, I don't know, 15 years ago. It was flash animation. And I got into that by doing prints first. So I was doing etching metal prints and, and got into animation that way. Yeah, ended up studying 3D animation at uni. Met a girl in Austria, uh, in, in England, ended up moving to Austria. And then to support myself over in Austria, I started working with my dad, working on a clinical trials pharmaceutical company, doing development stuff. So I ended up being the lead developer for that company, for that startup for the last 10 years. But then eventually realized I was just giving my lifetime away for nothing really. And it wasn't anything that I enjoyed doing at the end of it. And it was too technical and I just missed my arty side, right? I was just sat in front of the computer the whole day and doing no real creative output. So then I, you know, I've got two kids now, Levy and Oscar, and they're three and four. Oscar's three today. Happy birthday to Oscar. Anyway, so a month before Oscar was born, it was in, you know, he was born in December 2017. I quit my job and I, I, I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I just handed in my 120th invoice, monthly invoice. It was like, really, on the day, 10 years, I can't be bothered doing this anymore. And that's when I quit my job. Actually, I started the ceramic school in 2016. So I've jumped ahead a few years there. I started out basically with a Facebook page just to show my interest in ceramics and to share my interest in ceramics. And I'd be writing blog articles about things that I found interesting and posting videos and, and images of ceramic artists that I found interesting. And then eventually, you know, after doing that for a couple of months, I eventually got a following. I remember getting my first thousand followers after, you know, two or three months. I was like, whoa, a thousand followers. That's fantastic. There's so many people that like ceramics. You know, from 2016 till 2018, 2017. So like that whole year, I was focusing more and more time on that. And then eventually, December 2017, I quit my job and started doing, trying to do this as kind of like a full-time job. I'm also like a, a, a coach for businesses, small businesses in the area. So that's where most of my clients came from then for the next year or two. I was helping people, you know, fitness instructors and meditation practitioners. And I've got a pharmacy also in Vienna and um, a whole range of different clients. But again, that wasn't, you know, working for myself kind of, and I wanted to spend more time focusing on the ceramic school. You know, the ceramic school started out just as my interest, you know, sharing my interest and eventually it's built up and built up and we've grown an email list and uh, blog articles and, and Facebook pages and Instagram pages and um, you know now we've got a team working for us which is fantastic and we're able to put on events like the Ceramics Congress. For people who 
are not yet familiar with the ceramic school. Can you explain to us how does it exist virtually and and how does that translate into real tangible support for people who are trying to develop a career in ceramics? Sure. Um, so the main aim for me is to help share inspiration, first of all, and information of how people can, you know, improve their practice. We have then, you know, our Instagram pages on our Facebook page. That's where we share most of the inspirational stuff. We've also got a blog online and that shares more of the informational things. We also have then online workshops from professional ceramic artists from around the world that you can go and purchase and, and join in live. So on this Sunday, we've got a workshop from Don Williams, who's doing a rocket workshop. Half of it's gonna be pre-recorded, half of it's gonna be live, him unloading the kiln and having a Q and A. And then afterwards, we're gonna meet up and talk about Raku firing, right? And that's really nice because it's a worldwide community and we get people from all over the world joining, talking about Raku then. The, you know, for the Congress as well, I think it's, it was really interesting having everyone join up and talk, being able to talk with each other. So that's also, you know, the support that people get is just the social support as well. Because I think a lot of people have just sat at home on their own in their own home studios for the last couple of months. and. Um, I think it was really good to have that exchange. We're having also a monthly meetup now, so I want to start doing monthly meetups. I tried starting a few, while, you know, a few months ago, got waylaid with the Congress, but now from now on, we're going to be doing monthly meetups, a bit like Zoom calls, but more personal. So that's another way that we're helping support people, I guess. Yeah. So I I noticed looking around the the ceramic school site that there's a page that has groups like where you're targeting educators you know or people who are interested in business or how to make molds but there's not a lot of like dialogue in, in many of them yet how long have those groups existed on the platform and what are you doing to encourage engagement and dialogue about a year ago or about a year ago we set up our facebook group and that's now got ten thousand people inside sharing ceramic stuff but over the last year or so, you know, I think everyone's got privacy concerns with Facebook. And last year I set up a website called ceramicscommunity.com. That's sort of like a self-sustained community group forum, like a, a Facebook group, but not on Facebook, which is really cool. And we don't track any details or anything like that. So I think that was the main issue. You know, there are different issues with Facebook groups, with the searchability of, of information that gets lost in there as well. And there's no real way to to use it to harness all of the information that people put in there to really, you know, filter it. And yeah, there's, I don't know, there's a lot of problems with Facebook groups. So I started last year to make the ceramics community. One of the things I want is a unified platform and that was then separate to the ceramics school. So people then had two accounts and it was really confusing with different passwords and things. So the groups that you've just mentioned are just two weeks old. You know, I, I just installed them just before the ceramics Congress. Spent a lot of time actually last month just merging websites and copying over to different servers and big load of hassle moving, you know, 10,000 users over to a new server. And but yeah, that's the, the plan. So, you know, the plan is that you're going to have your ceramic school account and there's going to be different groups within there that are hopefully going to compete with Facebook groups. And it's going to be more organized and... and Fascinating to realize that this, the ceramics community was a separate entity from the ceramics school. You brought them together. And then we have groups on the ceramics school site. And there are also events, which is what the ceramics congress was, right? Mm -hmm. um, and But the, was, this wasn't the first ceramics congress, was it? No, this was the fourth one. Yeah. Okay. And so, so can <clears throat> you tell us a little bit about the history of the ceramics congresses and how they've been evolving yeah sure in 2018 i wanted to go to Ensika, um, but i live in austria europe so to fly me and my wife and my kids my two kids and go there like you get the flights get the hotel room eat out every day buy lots of pottery and ceramics <laughs> like it would have all added up so i couldn't afford to fly over there unfortunately and that's when in 2018 i was like I need to set up my own event and bring the people I'm interested in online so I can visit from my own home. And I started planning that in 2018. I I reached out first to Kurt Hamley, who I really liked, and he was the first one to say, yeah, let's do it. So we um, 
yeah, I put on the first Sonics Congress in March 2019. And then we did another one in October 2019, and then in May 2020. And then this was the fourth one. This one was organized around uh, Korean ceramics. So how are you deciding where the, the focus is going to be? And this is a multi-tiered question, Josh, sorry. <laughs> how am I going to Korea through the Ceramics Congress? Mm -hmm. So how often are you going to do them? Um, how do you decide what the central focus, where the you know regional focus is going to be? And how do you help me feel like I've traveled there? Mm -hmm. So to start with organizing them in, you know, the very first one, I just reached out to people that I was interested in and I'd love to take workshops from them. And, you know, most of them said yes. So that was how I organized. It's also how I organized the second one and the third one. I was just um, contacting people that I, I enjoyed, right? And I found interesting and I, I thought they could bring something online. And then for this career version, it's sort of, you know, leveling up a bit I think that's mainly because I, I met Vipu Swivlasa who took my he took my Instagram workshop online and um, we had an Instagram review afterwards and we called up and we talked about his Instagram account and he obviously does the uh, the charity work as well and he organized Clay for Community and Clay for Australia and um, we got on really well so we we then uh, stayed in touch and I asked him to work on a new project, Ceramics for Charity. And we raised money for the Black Lives Matter movement. We raised about $12,000. Then I invited him to work with me on the Ceramics Congress. So then it was me and Vipu really that sat down and thought about how we could make it better from last time. Cause he, he was also there in May and he really enjoyed it. And yeah, we decided to do, you know, focus on career and we invited then Hei Young Cho to curate an exhibition and we did a, a virtual exhibition with 50 artists from South Korea. She did a walkthrough tour as well. So she visited different locations and um, you could visit, like walk down the high street and she'd be talking about it and doing Q and A with it as well. And, you know, we had then three or four workshops from South Korean masters, which was really great. And she was also there to do the Q and A. So it was a full day. It was, you know, I think 11 hours of content just all focused on South Korea which was fantastic definitely now on my bucket list of places to visit I think yeah <laughs> that's pretty it's pretty amazing um the amount of content because it was 72 hours straight of content correct yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and you spoke about I'm kind of interested in the curious about the infrastructure of the congress and the schools you said you have a team of people who are working with you now and you've also on your site have said that you've paid out over $35,000 to artists. So what is the, is this a nonprofit? Is it a for-profit business? How are you, um, how is it all coming together and how did you pull a, a staff? Is it a staff or are they all volunteers? It's a staff and volunteers. Most, most of them are staff. We did have a couple of volunteers for the Congress. So I, you know, like I say, I studied art and I know the whole art scene where people expect to get paid on, you know, exposure. I don't really want to do that. So my philosophy is that, you know, I want to give out 50% of any profits that we make, basically. So for the Ceramics Congress, for example, we shared out 50% of all the ticket revenue between all of the artists. And so I've also got staff. So I pay someone to do uh, a South... African lady to do um, blog articles and to, to do outreach for me. And, um, you know, we've got other people doing our social media for us. And yeah, moving forward, we're going to be definitely having more staff for the Congress, you know, with Vipu, for example. And there's Fab, who is the moderator. She's going to be with us now. And Carol Epp is going to be doing the next one as well, hopefully focusing on Canada and Canadian artists, which should be good. Yeah, I have to tell you, I was really, I um, saw a, a q a that vipu was moderating and there were as you know we're all getting more comfortable with this zoom world there were of course a, kind of technical difficulties when things were getting and he just handled it so seamlessly you know and was a really good moderator at like bringing uh conversation 
to fruition to yeah. something productive for people. So that that was yeah. really nice um, to see. I think moving forward, focusing on a different country every time, which I think would be nice. So, you know, last time was Korea. This time is going to be Canada in May 2020, 21. And then um, when we do another one in November next year, it'll be focused on a different country, maybe England or maybe somewhere like Japan or, or Thailand or something. Yeah, it's a, it's a worldwide community, right? And I don't just want to focus on England or just focus on North America. There's a whole world of ceramics out there that we need to, you know, push and uh, expose people to, I think. Yeah, you and I think you were definitely doing that. Um, the Congress was was doing that. It was amazing to see the span of the globe that was in attendance at this. And you're putting up some like really huge numbers. I'm wondering like how how are you tracking who who comes? I mean, I'm sure it's all automated, but for us Luddites, will you explain how that works, how you capture those numbers? Yeah, for just for the Congress, you mean? That's just based on tickets sold, for example. Um, for our, you know, our website sees 30,000 clicks from Google each month. Our social media on Facebook and Instagram, we, you know, we get seen by 10 million people each month. Yeah, on our newsletter, you know, we've got, I think 50,000 people so far at the moment. So it's, yeah, it's going well. And do you see this, Josh, as um, a complement to Inseca, or do you see them as, as competition? One person got in touch with me about helping to organize Inseca, but I didn't hear back from her. So no, I don't know. I have offered my help, but they've not got in touch, so I don't know. I've never been to Enseeker, so I can't really comment. Um, but I don't think it, you know, I don't think it'll replicate an in-person meeting, to be honest. Uh, I think, you know, you do get pro the pros and benefit costs of each one, right? So an in-person event costs loads of money to, to rent the space. And it's also a huge environmental impact as well with all the travel that people do and all the, the waste food that people eat and all the styrofoam cups and things that people use and um i but then on the other side you know you meet real people in real life and you can talk and give each other hugs and and chat and go get drunk and go to restaurants and things together so i'm not sure if it's going to be replacing nck at all but i think it's the next best thing and it's one of the one of the things that i want to do is make sure it's like success as accessible as possible right so that's why we've only got a 10 US dollar entry fee to try and make it as accessible as possible for people in Chile, for people in South Africa, for people wherever else that's got really, you know, weak economies to try and open up as much as possible. And as far as I know, NC could tickets are really expensive and you have to travel and you have to live there and you have to eat out and stuff. And here you can just stay in your pajamas at home, slob out, and it doesn't cost you anything. It costs you $10 to travel the world, basically. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm not trying to. I'm not really thinking about Enseco when I'm organizing these events. I know that they're there, but I, I've never been, so I've got I've got no comparison. I'm just I'm just trying to make the best online event possible for me, basically, <laughs> and and everyone else can join in, right? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's how a lot of great ideas start. You know, what what void do you see in the marketplace, and then you make it be there. Um, but I just I wanted to circle back was when you're talking about being able to be in your pajamas and attend this. Um, one of the things that Austin Taylor talked about in her review was the uh, networking on the Congress, um, that there's a little button over to the side you can click on. And it, it's a randomizer. And she likens it to chat roulette without all the downsides of chat roulette. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> And when I, re Carol Epp had told me about that part of the Congress and how it replicated for her bumping into someone in a hall at Enseca and being able to have a, so I, I clicked on it and I, I have to tell you a baseline introvert here. And I was horrified that when I realized like a total stranger was going to pop up and I was going yeah. to have to have a conversation. So I'm curious, like some people seem to love it and I, there have to be other people who feel like me, like, Whoo! oh, it's too. So yeah. What, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, I'm curious, what feedback have you gotten on that feature? 
Yeah, some, you know, we've had rave reviews from people that enjoyed it. And it is, it is a scary thing, turning on your camera and turning on your microphone, right? People are used to just watching, you know, watching YouTube videos, watching webinars that are really passive, watching, you know, classes online that you just watch basically. And <clears throat> it is a big step to actually join in the conversation and turn on your camera and your video. So yeah, the people that did it loved it. And that was one of their favorite parts about it. Um, I personally love it, but I can appreciate, you know, for, it takes a while to get used to basically. The platform that we use just this time around is a bit fast. So like you click on connect and then straight away you connect with someone, right? So that is a bit scary. Next time around, we're gonna be using a different software platform and that gives you then like an, a photo of them and a description It says, would you like to connect, yes or no? And then it's a lot more, you know, it eases you then into it and say, oh, he's interested in wood fire pottery or whatever she's interested in, in whatever, ramen or something, you know? So hopefully that'll get people, you know, more used to it. But I think when you do make the jump and when you talk face to face to people, then you, you get loads out of it, you just, it's fantastic yeah well yeah. i i appreciate the slowdown step for the introverts and the yeah. <laughs> listening you know in my heart i know you're right that it would be probably rewarding in ways that i couldn't imagine but i was like yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea that you're gonna slow it down a little yeah it's funny one of the only complaints got about the networking feature was that it was quick you know, it started three minutes long and then you had to, you know, it cut off and you could connect with each other and then you'd meet the next person. And then I increased it to five minutes and then people were still saying it was too quick. And then it was at 10 minutes at the end. So you could, you know, a 10 minute conversation and people were still getting saying it's too short. So um, yeah, it was a really good way to, you know, meet new friends from all over the world, basically. It's fantastic. One of the things that you do that I think is really interesting and helpful, if we go back to the professional coaching aspect is that you you offer the like blog posts and uh, workshops to ceramic artists and I'm I'm curious ab about that leg of it like is it just um, sort of a, a class that we can log on to if we're members of the ceramic school or is it do you get one-on-ones with you as well in terms of the pottery workshops that we organize that are live, you know, we we're aiming for once a week pottery workshops. And um, that comes in the form of, you know, a, a pre-recorded edited workshop video. And the artist is there with you answering your questions in the chat, which I really like. And then there's a live Q and A at the end of it. So you can talk face to face with the artist. And um, that's a format that I really enjoy. For my workshops, so I do business coaching as well. Um, I do a six week workshop and that includes weekly meetings with the, with the people that subscribe. So you get you know, a video and a worksheet each day. And at the end of the week, we can have a call, go through your progress basically. So I've, I've done that a couple of times in the past. I'm gonna start making it a more regular thing. So at the moment I'm not offering it, but it's gonna come back probably in January, 2021. And I've got a few other surprises, hopefully lined up as well to do with that, to do with uh, selling ceramics. So yeah, but it's all basically, you know, you get lifetime access to the material, you get a big booklet to work, to work through and videos and step-by-step -step instructions on how to do everything from social media, setting up your website, online advertising, email marketing, um, graphic design, logo design, uh, you know, your personal brand. We go through everything from A to Z basically step by step and laid out really well. I I started with my Instagram course a couple of years ago now. I created this Instagram course because I was trying to get my mum onto Instagram and she had no idea how to do it. I was like, I'll sit down with you and we'll go through it. And she didn't have time. So then I wrote it all down in a book and she said she didn't have time to read it. So I was like, okay, so what can I do now? So I made it into short one minute videos and says so like, this is how you log on to Instagram one minute video to show you how to do it. This is how you edit a photo. This is how you frame your photos the best. This is how you use hashtags all in, you know, one minute videos. So it's then, it's still like a six hour course, but it's easy, easy to go through and you get worksheets for the whole thing. So yeah, basically with me, with my workshops, I try and be super comprehensive. I 
I realize I know a great deal and um, and I try and cater for every level of a person. So even if you've never touched a computer before, like if you take my workshop, I'll be able to, I'll be able to help you set up your online business, basically. I think that's something that I'm really interested in, creating websites and learning how to use them to sell, sell your work. So Josh, that brings me to, um, we've been at Studio Potter working on a series of, we published the first in a series of articles about the gallery artist relationship and how it's evolving and how it can potentially continue to evolve away from the traditional 50-50 commission split that a gallery gets for representing artists. Um, because you know many artists find that they can build their own following on social media and the shipping costs um, to the galleries or from the galleries start to really cut in to profits as does the commission. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, in the conversations, I what I found in listening to the group assembled was that we've, it really comes down to deciding what path you wanna be on and seeing that through. But I also feel like we never really got a, a solid answer about how it can change. And I don't know that that kind of change happens unless people's hands are forced, but I'm, I'm really curious to hear your take on that relationship as a, you know, coming from a business perspective, how do you think that that relationship is evolving and can evolve? Big question. Um, uh, you know, obviously the, the relationship you've got is a classic relationship of being, you know, a producer and then of the shop selling it, right? And if, if you imagine yourself as a factory and a factory owner producing stuff, you then send it to the shop that's on the high street. And like I say, the thing that you're paying for there is real estate, basically. You're paying for that gallery to have a space on the high street and getting customers through the door. But yeah, nowadays you don't need a physical studio on the high street to attract customers. You can just use the internet. You know, it depends which way you want to go. You can obviously, galleries are fine, right? You can still sell to galleries if you don't want to handle any of the stuff yourself, right? Um, and there are people making loads and loads of money doing that. And they just say, right, there's my gallery. You can just only buy my work through my gallery. I think as creative people and as potters, especially, we all want to do everything ourselves. It seems like most of us want to do everything ourselves. And that's included in it, right? You just, and it's really easy to get started. So I think it's, it's up to you really to decide, you know, the, the cost and the, and the benefits of doing it yourself. If you find a good gallery and they're selling your work all the time and you've got a good relationship, that's perfect. But it's not something I think that you need to have. I think that's changed now. I think it used to be that you had to find someone and you had to get into a gallery and then you've kind of made it. And then you had to find another gallery and then another one and you need to use them as hopping, you know, stepping stones. But nowadays, you know, you can get a thousand followers on Instagram and that could bring you as much money in as selling in a local gallery. My personal opinion, I think galleries are kind of, it depends where you live, right? But my hometown in Lancaster, we've got, I think, two art galleries in a city of over 100,000 people, right? There are two main galleries on the high street. And if you don't get in, what do you do? Where do you go? You, you can't do anything. Then you have to go to, to the next city down the road. I think it depends on how hard the gallery works to sell your work. But in my experience, people would just, they just want to sell something and it's not necessarily, they want to sell your work, if that makes sense. Like someone works into a gallery, they don't know what they want. They want a painting or a, a mug or a vase or something crocheted or whatever. A gallery owner, I don't think really cares what they buy. They just want to sell something. So I think that's also the benefit of going it on your own. And, you know, I think in this day and age, everyone should have a website. Everyone should have an online shop. If you are working with a gallery, then you have to still, you know, make sure you don't undercut the gallery. You have to work together with the pricing and figure out if you want to give them commission or not, if they get, you know, if they refer someone to your online shop. But yeah, I, I think if you're willing to put in the work and and do it yourself, it's easily possible. And then you get 50% of your money back, right? So it's, it's up to you, basically. <laughs> you know, if you're willing to put in the hours, at the end of the day, you'll, you'll end up with a business that can run online without giving away half of your profit. And I think that is that is the one of the things that you need to invest in as a business. Yeah, no, I think I think that was a great a great answer. 
you have to yeah decide where do you want to put your effort mm -hmm. i think that's also a valid point though about <clears throat> you know the gallery owners do get to decide yes or no they are the gatekeepers of the craft basically and if if you allow someone to say no to you it's not good enough right are you going to allow that yes or no like i i wouldn't accept that if you know i was selling my work i'd be like no i'm gonna do it on my own so you know if you look at the in england for example i think most of the the people in the galleries are men doing wood firing um there's not a huge range of diversity there um and again it's up to the gallery owners yeah that was another nice thing about the congress i thought there was a really a huge breadth of the types of works that were being seen um and it it truly is global josh which is really exciting mm -hmm. uh, yeah that's something that i set out to to do in the in the first congresses i you know i didn't want to just invite people from america for example i wanted to invite everyone um but that's one of the things that Vipu really stepped up and, and he was like the, the artistic director. So he made a list of all the people that he would like to see, give workshops and me and him went through the list and um, you know, we worked together to do that. And that's one of his focuses is being diverse, right? And not just having male white potters and um, you know, having people from everywhere, basically. A final leg of the Congress is that you have a booth area that in essence mimics the expo hall that we would have at Inseca. Right now there wasn't, I, be, I believe correct, there wasn't a charge to have a booth there. Mm -hmm. And how, I guess, how, how full do you hope the expo hall gets? Um, and how many, how many did you have this year? Booths? How many booths? I think, um, I don't know, 15, 20, not many. And yeah. how, how do you want to grow that? And, and how do you, some of them did demos. Is that the way that you get one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with people? Yeah, yeah. So the, the expo booth, this was something that I, I did in May last year. This time around in November, I just didn't have time to do it. So we only started organizing the expo booths like two weeks before the Congress, right? Because Carol Epp stepped in and she said, how can I help you? And I was like, we need to do expo booths, but I'm editing all the videos and I'm still working on the adverts and I'm still doing this and that. So please, can you step in and do that? So she was fantastic organizing that and reaching out to people to do the expo booths. And yeah, in terms of cost, like it has a cost to me, right? So so every expo booth costs me something um, to put on, but I'm, I, I don't want to charge hundreds and hundreds of dollars for it. I don't, you know, it's not, you know, the cost is is a lot cheaper than host having a booth at Enseco, for example, where they charge quite a lot for the week. I would be more, I'm more interested on in going on the lines of having it for free. But if you make any sales, then, you know, if you make any profit, then maybe give us a commission. That's what we did last time as well. It's just, here's your free booth. If you make any sales, send us some money if you want to. If you don't want to send us any money, that's completely fine as well. Um, I don't want to rip into your profit margins and stuff. I I see it more of, a, of an opportunity for people to, you know, experience new products and, and meet new people as well. And I don't want to give, like if I took money from you and I said it's 500 euros for the expo booth, there's a pressure on me then for you to sell 500 euros worth of stuff. And I'm not sure I like that dynamic of, you know, me having then, owing you $500 or making sure that you sell it. And I'm also not sure then how salesy everything would be there. I'm, I don't know, I'm just not keen on the idea of charging for the expo booth at the moment. I quite like it being free because I also get to, to watch the demos, right? There was GR Pottery Forms there doing demos and he was doing demos twice, three times a day. And it was fantastic. We had loads of people in there doing you know, asking questions, getting answers, talking directly with him. And um, yeah, that's what I want to be basically a big, you know, virtual online expo booth. I'm curious to know what you think are the, the biggest successes that you've had with the ceramic school and the ceramic congresses. And what do you find to be the biggest challenges? The biggest successes are definitely this last Congress. That was the, the biggest success so far we had, you know, 5,000 people online and all at the same time watching workshops from the world over. I think that's that's one of the things I want to aim for, right, is 
is building this community up and being the space for you know to make that happen you know next one in in may hopefully we're going to get reach 10,000 people that would be great uh, that's just, that is one of my highlights it's the highlight of the year for me doing the congress because it's super intense it's very very sociable i'm not even sure if i'm recovered now right it's been two weeks and i'm still like i'm still drained so you know if i'm speaking slowly or i've got bags under my eyes it's just because that that weekend is just like the the ultimate weekend for me for the whole year the challenges i guess is for me personally with the ceramic school trying to do everything myself still that's a big lesson that i'm learning and i'm still working on i you know being a developer and a programmer and a very very kind of like a perfectionist as well i guess i just want to do everything myself and that's one of the challenges i've got is letting people help me um i think the page is called work with us mm -hmm. and i i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how people can get involved and what sort of partnerships like are you open to anything or are there specific things you're looking for yes we're open to anything anything just send us an email and see if you can work with us basically we've got our our blog which is you know how i started the sonic school four years ago now that's been heavily neglected the last year or two so if you want to write a blog article for us please email us and we will pay you for your blog article. We had, you know, we had a woman yesterday email us from Italy who wants to start writing book reviews because she's a librarian. I was like, yeah, cool, do it. Let's, let's get on the call this week and we can work together and do some book reviews and, you know, you'll get paid for it. You know, obviously now we're focusing more on online workshops and so far it's just been me who's been picking people and saying, you know, would you please do a workshop for me? If you're interested in hosting an online workshop with us, then definitely get in touch and we'll see if we can work together. For the Ceramics Congress, <clears throat> we're starting to plan the next one in May. So if you're interested in volunteering, we're hopefully also gonna have some paid positions available. I'm not sure yet what that will be. <laughs> we're still we're still trying to organize everything, but um, yeah, basically I want, you know, I'm aiming to be the best online platform for Ceramics and I'm open for everything, basically. Well, Josh, I really I appreciate you taking the time um, to talk to us about this, talk to me about it this morning. Um, I think it's really exciting and uh, interesting to see how far that you've come and that, I don't know, maybe the, pa the pandemic has given you the opportunity to get more people are open to this sort of experience. So it'll be exciting to see where it goes. Like I said, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really lucky that I can do this as a job now and um, basically attend workshops every week. And <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the future because I do want to, you know, break, I don't know, break the paradigms, I guess, or like, you know, try and upset the system. I, I do want to do that. And I want to try and give more people more opportunity to, you know, to connect and to sell their pottery and um yeah it is really exciting i i think you know we're on the way to becoming re a really good hub an online community of, of ceramic artists and i'm really excited for the future yeah yeah they can email me um that's on our website office at ceramic.school or they can submit a support ticket or they can open up a ceramic school account um, for free and then you get your own profile basically and you can send me a message send me a or send me an instagram message or a facebook message whatever platform you're on um basically i'm on there and i'll answer your questions personally and um yeah we'll get in touch one of the other things i wanted to touch upon was um contracts i guess yeah because so far for the last three for the last three summits congresses we didn't have any sort of formal contract uh, it was just basically trust right um and this time i worked together with vipu to try and create the best online contract for ceramic artists and i think doing research all the contracts at the moment from the other places seem very restrictive and um not so good you know like hardly any percentages or hardly any commissions or anything like that so one of the things that things that we do is um if you host an online workshop with us you get 50 percent of the profit split you get to also keep your 
uh, your video. So you can sell that on, on your own website afterwards, or you could put it on YouTube for free afterwards if you wanted to do that. We don't have any exclusive rights on your videos. And if you keep it in our shop, then you get 50% of all sales moving forward for any workshop that you promote. And you also get then royalties as well on top of that. So we're really trying to, and the royalties that we provide, uh, as far as I can see, two times as good as any other contract out there. So, um, you know, I'm really trying my best to make it a fair platform as well for artists. And I'm not at all trying to rip people off, <laughs> you know, coming from an artist background is, you know, I, I appreciate people don't want to get paid in exposure and stuff. So yeah, just so people know, like, yeah, I don't know. There's... Yeah, no, thank, thank you for bringing that up. That's a that's a great point, which may, I've been in, brought an indelicate question to mind. Do you take a, a salary for what you do administering this or are you basically most of your income is coming from your, your business coaching and other things? Um, no, I don't really take a salary. Um, I, I don't know. I try and I try and keep as much money in the bank as possible, to be honest, and try and use that then to grow the business. Will you enjoy the birthday? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Really nice to meet you, Josh. Yeah, you too.